Okay, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, Alex, uh, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to this uh, IBAS technical session, an interesting topic on precipitation. So I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Alex to the youngsters, especially. Uh, Alex, uh, after doing his uh, BSc in chemistry and geology from Ghana, then he did it my MSc in chemical engineering from Norway. Then for the first 10 years, he worked as a teacher, then research assistant. Then in 94, he joined uh, Wesley Almina and then worked there for about 16 years uh, in various capacities. Then he moved on to Nalco Chemicals, who are the suppliers for the Almina industry. And there he worked for five years. And then for the six years, he was in EGA in uh, Dubai. So he is currently the MD of CBAC, um, uh, about which uh, he will uh, he, uh, explain during his talk. So um, now this is a pre-recorded uh, presentation. So I request uh, uh, Priyanka of IBAS to take over and uh, run the presentation through. At the end of the presentation, Alex is available um, uh, physically and uh, you can ask questions. Yeah, Priyanka. Priyanka. Hello. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alex Richmond Abuaji. I am um, a director in a company called Consolidated Bauxite Alumina and Aluminium Consultancy, CBAC for short. CBAC is a consultancy company registered in Australia and in Ghana. Uh, today, I will be giving a talk on improving alumina yield while maintaining product quality in Bayer precipitation circuits. Uh, my aim here is to uh, generate discussion about this topic uh, because I believe there are people in, the, in this forum that have experience the on, on field experience about this topic. And I would like to learn from uh, those who are uh, in the field and operating alumina refineries and the challenges they are facing in this area. I think it is a good forum for all of us to learn. So that will be my objective to raise questions and some of the issues as I understand them and hopefully generate a discussion at the end. Okay, so uh, the objectives of uh, this talk is to challenge the mode of operation of alumina refinery precipitation circuits. Uh, I also intend to demonstrate the extent to which liquor productivity can be increased. Uh, I will show that higher liquor productivity and product quality operating conditions are often opposed to each other. And I hope to discuss how to realize increased liquor productivity without compromising product quality. And then look at the potential cost benefits if product quality bottleneck challenge is removed. So why high liquor productivity? Uh, high liquor productivity is obviously um, a requirement in all alumina refineries for reasons of higher production rates. Uh, the higher the production rates, uh, the lower the unit cost of production. Uh, it, it, it is also um, uh, for better environmental outcomes. And uh, not the least is 
uh, higher liquor productivity means uh, better bottom line or better profit. Uh, but in addition to higher liquor productivity, uh, refineries also need to produce smelter grade alumina of a certain quality. And the reasons why these uh, pro quality requirements are important are because smelter operators require them. They specify some of these uh, product quality uh, requirements. Uh, it is also for uh, to satisfy uh, environmental uh, regulatory requirements. And also, uh, sometimes you need to have uh, uh, this type of requirements in order for your alumina refinery to run and operate smoothly. So this shows that well, both of these requirements, high uh, liquor productivity as well as uh, better alumina quality are critical requirements of refineries. But it is also known that product quality and high liquor productivity conditions often are opposed to each other. And therefore, um, refineries tend to uh, operate uh, their precipitation circuits to uh, achieve product quality at the expense of production. In other words, they sacrifice huge production gains in order to achieve uh, a high liquor product in order to achieve product quality, I should say. A yield or liquor productivity is a parameter uh, that alumina refineries uh, measure regularly and really stay on top uh, in order to ensure that they meet their production targets. So what are the factors that affect liquor productivity or yield? Uh, some of the factors are the precipitation circuit design itself. So how well uh, mixed, how well mixed are the tanks? Are they uh, perfect CSTRs or are they classifiers? Uh, the other factor is liquor composition. So um, most alumina refineries, even though they operate quite similar um, uh, total sodas, will have very different yields. And this is often due to the presence and the levels of impurities such as sulfate, chloride, carbonate, oxalate, et cetera. Uh, impurities that I term junkets. They are in the liquor, but they do not contribute to production. They, in fact, they hinder uh, higher liquor productivity because of their presence. Uh, and uh, these uh, impurities uh, are as a result of the uh, bauxite often is, is a result of the bauxite that is being processed, as well as uh, the type of uh, water that is being used, whether water is recycled in the, from, the, uh, from the mud disposal areas back into the process. And also uh, another factor is what type of chloride that is being, uh, what type of caustic that is being used. Uh, so uh, refineries that tend to use um, membrane type caustic uh, tend to have lower chlorides in their liquor. Then there's also the slurry properties. Uh, for example, uh, if there are high levels of impurities, uh, oxalate uh, become very buoyant and can form what in some refineries they experience as oxalate rafters, which can lead to slurry disgorgement from, from uh, precipes. Then there are the other operating conditions uh, which, uh, which 
influence the kinetics of the alumina precipitation reaction conditions like what temperature your what field temperature uh, you operate in your precips, uh, what the C charge uh, levels are in the tank, and what the super saturation in the liquor going to precipitation are. These are the factors that uh, will determine uh, your yield. Uh, this slide shows uh, the liquor composition and yields from uh, different alumina refineries that I've labeled A, B, C, and D. And um, uh, what can be seen here is that these refineries operate uh, quite similar to tar sodas. So their total sodas are not that different, and yet they, they achieve very different yields. And what can be seen is that uh, refineries that have quite high impurities uh, tend to have low yields, and refineries that have low impurities tend to have high yields. Uh, this, is, uh, this is because a huge part of the total soda uh, are impurities, basically what I've termed junkets. And these, uh, these are high, predominantly because of the bauxite that are processed in these in this, uh, refineries. So the active caustic uh, that really are productive, that helps in the yield, uh, is reduced uh, due to the uh, large part occupied by the junkets. Uh, so now let us turn our attention to some of the product quality requirements. Uh, some of the critical product quality requirements uh, that are affected by high liquor productivity are uh, alumina soda content. That is soda that is incorporated into the hydrate, uh, which uh, tend to uh, increase the uh, product soda. Uh, then there is the particle size here. Uh, the emphasis tends to be on fines. So too much fines in product due to excessive nucleation is one of the uh, problems that refineries grapple with in order to meet product quality requirements. And then another factor is uh, the particle strength or uh, what is measured as attrition index. Uh, that is also um, a challenge um, in, in alumina refineries. Uh, one thing uh, a lot of alumina refineries uh, suffer are cycles in their uh, product uh, particle size. Uh, the, uh, alumina refineries tend to experience cycles of fines and Cause coarsening of the circuit uh, from time to time. Uh, often these uh, fine incidents are not detected, mainly due to uh, the kind of uh, particle size analyzer that are used in, in the refineries. They tend to be volume-based uh, particle size analyzers. And as we know, these volume-based particle size analyzers are not very sensitive to uh, uh, fines because the fines tend to have very little volume and they, they are therefore not detected by volume particle size analyzers. So what most refineries are doing these days is they are resorting to 
uh, particle counters in order to monitor their population balance, uh, the population balance in their circuits. Uh, these particle uh, counters are sensitive to much smaller particles and they can inform about whether there has been a nucleation incident beyond what is normal so that refineries can get on top of it and, and quench it, nip it in the bud before it becomes a, a major uh, incident. Uh, so now uh, I, we take a look at liquor productivity versus product quality or particle size. So the parameters that refineries tend to use to uh, improve their yield are temperature, initial A to C, surface area or C charge, caustic concentration, and holding time. Uh, so typically refineries would like to run low temperatures into their precipes because the lower the temperature, uh, the better the, the yield. And this is through supersaturation. So the lower your temperature, the higher your supersaturation, and therefore uh, the greater your yield. But uh, this uh, parameter, uh, this mode of increasing yield has a, a couple of downsides. Uh, one of them is too high nucleation, uh, too high supersaturation leads to higher nucleation, which can turn your uh, product fine. Um, the other aspect of it is that uh, too, uh, too much supersaturation due to uh, uh, low temperatures can increase soda incorporation into, into the product. Uh, the belief or the, the theory around this is uh, the precipitation of the hydrate onto uh, the seed from the solution, sodium aluminate uh, onto a seed uh, is accompanied by release of sodium hydroxide molecule, which has to diffuse away from the surface of the particle before the next layer of hydrate is, uh, is precipitated. And if the supersaturation is very high and also the low temperature diffusion tends to be slow. So uh, the molecule does, the sodium hydroxide molecule does not have enough time to diffuse away before the next layer of hydrate is precipitated on the surface. And in so doing, it tends to trap the sodium hydroxide molecule and thereby increase uh, product soda. Uh, in fact, some alumina refineries try to control their product soda by increasing their temperature. When their product soda gets high, they increase uh, uh, precipitation temperature in order to try and reduce the soda incorporated. So this is a classic example of how one this particular parameter are opposed to uh, 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 the two, I guess, um, two factors that are being uh, that are being sought. Uh, the, the desire to increase yield is opposed to. Uh, the desire to achieve lower uh, soda incorporation. So that is a classic example of that. Uh, the initial A to C is very similar to the temperature because that is also uh, uh, the concept of high supersaturation. And the same argument about uh, nucleation that applies to lowering temperature also applies to the uh, high supersaturation due to a high AGC, that also leads to fine generation. Then there is a surface area, which is often achieved uh, by 
high C charge. Uh, so high C charge means a high population of particles in your intermediate and finals or your growth section, the growth section of the precip. And what, whilst this helps with surface area for precipitation and therefore increase in yield, uh, the high population means that there's a lot of particle-particle interaction and also particle wall interaction, as well as particle agitator interaction. And this tends to lead to secondary nucleation, which can also increase your, uh, uh, a lot of fines in the product. And then there is the caustic uh, concentration, uh, which is another way refineries use to uh, increase yield. Well, this is a difficult way to increase yield, but it is uh, sometimes applied. Um, so uh, usually the uh, caustic concentration uh, influences the yield uh, through, the, uh, through the way that alumina refineries calculate yield. So the, uh, the uh, conventional way of calculating the yield is to determine the delta across the delta A to C across precip, and then multiply it by the caustic concentration in your LTP. And, and from this equation, it, it follows logically that by increasing your C, whilst maintaining a constant supersaturation, a yield can also be increased. But again, this uh, can lead to fines. Then there's the holding time. The holding time uh, is probably the one parameter that helps in both direction, both the yield and particle size. Because the longer your slurries uh, stay in your precipes, the better the yield. And also the better the growth around the particle and therefore the particle strength uh, improves as well as the average particle diameter also uh, uh, improves. Uh, in this slide, uh, we, are, uh, we are showing the results of a lab experiment that demonstrates the impact of uh, temperature variation on yield. So uh, in this, uh, the same liquor uh, and the same C charge are held at different temperatures and the yield and particle size in each, uh, uh, in each case are measured. So in the blank where there is no, uh, part, uh, no crystal growth modifier, uh, they, by decreasing the precipitation temperature from 78 to 72, the yield, um, the yield increases from around 40.7 to about 42.5, uh, as can be seen by this, uh, by this uh, chart here. Uh, but the other thing that is also clear from this, that is obvious from this is the particle size deteriorates the particle becomes finer uh, uh, one, uh, when, the, uh, when the temperature is reduced. Uh, so once you've achieved your yield, your particle size, the fine fraction has increased. Or if you like, the plus 45 has decreased from 75 to 60, around 67. So the way to overcome this to achieve both the yield and also maintain particle size is to dose a crystal growth modifier. What that crystal growth modifier does is that it coarsens the product. You still improve your yield uh, and at the same time maintain the particle size that is desired. And there are different uh, uh, crystal growth modifiers on the market. Some a lot more potent and um, more effective in coarsening product.
in this uh, slide, we, uh, it shows the result of a lab experiment in which uh, the same liquor held at the same temperature, but charged with different seed uh, charge uh, in, uh, affect the yield and also the particle size. So as can be seen in this blank test, uh, the seed charge is increased from 62 and a half to 112 and a half, almost a doubling of the seed charge. And as can be seen, the yield uh, increases from around 46 and a half to about 52, 53 almost 53 grams per liter. But what is also seen is that accompanying this yield is a deterioration in the particle size. So the particle size, the plus 45 micron, uh, decreases from around 84 to about 71. In other words, the minus 45 has increased. Uh, so, so this is a, a very, uh, simple experiment to demonstrate the impact of sea charge on yield and particle size. Uh, the, the way to uh, take advantage of this yield and not uh, and also maintain your, 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 your product quality is to dose a crystal growth modifier. Uh, so as can be seen in this chart and in this chart, uh, this chart, crystal group modifiers uh, uh, help to coarsen the product whilst at the same time giving you the desired yield. Uh, so that is, that is a, a simple test to demonstrate uh, how yield can be improved whilst at the same time maintaining product quality. And so now I turn my attention to uh, uh, mod the model developed by CBAC uh, for precipitation circuits. So the assumptions for the model are, uh, it's a yield only model. Uh, the precipitation tanks are continuous stair tank reactors. Uh, the reaction kinetic is assumed as second order uh, precipitation kinetic with respect to relative supersaturation. And this is based on a laboratory kinetic test. And the surface area used is a laboratory measured uh, surface area uh, from particle size analyzer used in alumina refineries. And uh, the surface area is corrected with a seed surface activity factor. Uh, this slide shows the alumina precipitation kinetics as measured in the lab using alumina refinery liquor. Uh, so the approach here is to fit the kinetic run, which is a measure of the concentration of alumina converted to supersaturation uh, and time to an order of reaction. Uh, and the, uh, this method that is used here is called a try and error method. So equations are usually developed for first order, second order, third order, and the data is fitted to each of these others. And the one that shows the best fit or the highest uh, correlation uh, uh, is is assumed to be the order by which uh, the reaction is occurring. So in this case, the supersaturation, uh, the, the data has been fitted to uh, second order kinetics uh, with respect to supersaturation. And as can be seen, the correlation coefficient is 0.9958, showing a very good fit to second order uh, kinetic reaction. So that is what is used in the model that I'm going to talk about in the subsequent slides. Uh, so it, uh, now we turn our attention to developing the precipitator performance equation now that we know the kinetics. 
and as mentioned before, uh, we assume a, a continuous third tank reactor. Uh, we assume that the precipitators behave as CSTRs. And then a mass balance uh, across a precipitator uh, using the kinetics that have been developed and combining it with a CSTR flow pattern uh, leads to the equation shown here. Um, so in this equation, uh, the performance equation is a function of uh, the Arrhenius rate constant, the surface area, a surface activity factor, the residence style, and the supersaturation entering and leaving the tank. Uh, so as mentioned, K is the Arrhenius rate constant and is defined as K is equal to K0 exponent EA over RT. K is the pre-exponential factor. EA is the activation energy for Gibbs-side precipitation. Uh, R is the gas constant and T is the temperature. And the other uh, factors in the equation, uh, the S is the specific surface area. A is the surface activity factor for hydro particles and tau is residence time. And uh, the other factors in the equation are the supersaturation. So XAI is a relative supersaturation entering tank I and is defined as the alumina uh, concentration in grams per liter minus the uh, equilibrium alumina solubility uh, at the tank conditions all divided by the alumina equilibrium solubility uh, at the tank conditions. The alumina uh, equilibrium solubility is calculated from the rosenberg Healy solubility model. And, and similarly, the uh, supersaturation exiting the tank is calculated in a similar fashion. So now that the performance equation has been developed for each tank, now uh, the model is set up for a refinery. So uh, the refinery uh, number of tanks and the conditions in each section of the tank uh, is obtained. And then the model is set up to mimic exactly uh, what happens in the refinery. So in this uh, case for refinery A, there are six agglomes, uh, eight intermediates, and four, row of, four rows of finals, each consisting of 11 tanks. And the uh, uh, conditions in each section of the tank is obtained. So residence times temperature are obtained. And the liquor entering the, uh, entering the agglomerate and uh, any section of the uh, plant is also obtained. So um, the boxes here uh, each represent a tank. So this is the first agglom tank, second agglom tank, and so on up to the sixth agglom tank. So what happens is we calculate the supersaturation entering into the aglo on 692. It enters the first aglo, alumina precipitates, and the supersaturation reduces to 0.476. It then cascades into the second tank, uh, more alumina precipitates, and the supersaturation reduces to 0.355, and to the next tank, and so on and so forth, until we come out of the last agglomerate tank. Then the slurry enters the uh, first uh, tank in the intermediate section, where the liquor will be cooled, and more seed will be added, and uh, most often, more LTP is also added. Then the supersaturation is calculated to be 0.561 and enters the first tank. It reacts, alumina reacts, and the supersaturation reduces to 4.89, cascades into the next tank, and to the next, and to the next, until it comes out of the last one. And then it enters into the finals. And in the finals, uh, the temperature is reduced again, so the supersaturation goes up uh, to 
0.437, and then it reacts in these tanks to uh, uh, where the, uh, the, the alumina uh, supersaturation is reduced until it comes out of the uh, final prism. Uh, this slide shows uh, typical data that will be collected from a refinery, the liquor composition, as well as the temperature in the various sections of the uh, aglo, the flow, uh, LTP flow rate, uh, this will be calculated, and then the alumina solubility and relative supersaturations will be calculated. So that uh, the, the data is then input into the model and the model is simulated. And then the model is tuned using uh, the uh, surface, uh, surface, surface area activity factor. Uh, and uh, the, the simulation is, the simulation outcome is, is compared to the refinery uh, data. So in this uh, slide, you, uh, this is the uh, data uh, produced by the refinery uh, that accompanied the liquor, uh, the input liquor and input uh, data that was uh, given. And this is the model output. So this, uh, the first uh, line is final overflow A uh, for the refinery and for the model. Uh, the final overflow ATC for the refinery and the model and the plant yield for the refinery and the model. And as you can see, there's very good agreement between the refinery data and the model output. So once the model has been calibrated, uh, some uh, hypothet hypothetical um, uh, refinery uh, improvement predictions are, are then made. So what are the potential production improvements that can be achieved? So we take uh, a 1 million ton per annum alumina refinery with a yield of about 70 gram per liter, uh, LTP flow of about 1650 cubic meter per hour, and then the following yield and benefits can be uh, uh, achieved by adjusting fuel temperature and sea charge in precipitation and then uh, and applying crystal growth modifier. So for example, changes in the fuel temperature from one to six, we uh, give yield increases ranging from 0.8 to 4.5 with, uh, with this accompanying um, uh, production levels of about 11,000 to 60,000 tons per year uh, improvement. Uh, similarly, uh, changes in the C charge uh, C charge can be increased be, uh, between five, say five and 25. These are just arbitrarily numbers chosen to demonstrate the, uh, the assessment that can be done with the model. And the, uh, with these changes in C charge, uh, the yield increase, uh, you can get a yield increase ranging from 0.3 to 1.6 uh, with a, and a corresponding annual production increase of 4,721,000 tons a year. Uh, it needs to be noted though that actual yield will vary from refinery to refinery as it is a function of both liquor chemistry and precipitation design. So actual yield increase needs to be estimated for each uh, refinery. So the approach typically used by CBAC uh, is first in discussion with the refinery operator uh, uh, to assess the capacity for the precipitation conditions to be manipulated using uh, existing uh, equipment without any capital investment. This is what we call uh, low hanging fruits. Uh, if there is capacity, then, uh, then conditions such as temperature, sea charge, alumina to caustic ratio, caustic concentration, et cetera, will be manipulated to determine the optimum yield and hence product, production gains that can be achieved. Then the next step will be uh, to compare uh, product quality specifications to actuals being achieved in the refinery. 
to assess if there are opportunities to capitalize on them. So for example, if a, a soda in product a limit is say 0.4 percent and the refinery is a, a achieving 0.3, then there is obviously room to uh, manipulate super saturation in the tank through temperature or through A to C uh, without jeopardizing uh, the product soda. Similarly, if, uh, 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 if the minus 45 or minus 325 mesh is below the lower limit of the specification, then there's room to, to manipulate the precipitation conditions without uh, jeopardizing the particle size. However, if the particle size is already on edge at, at the limit, then other tools such as crystal group modifiers may be applied uh, and tested to make sure that they work uh, before uh, these parameters are adjusted. So uh, typically, the tools for controlling product quality to ensure any product quality excursions can be controlled are first tested uh, to ensure that they will deliver and they will maintain product quality within a uh, specification before the changes are made. So, like I said, first, the low hanging fruits are tested. And, uh, and once that is exhausted, uh, the assessment will be made if capital investment in equipment is required to capture the remaining production opportunities and if they are economically viable. The approach that was, um, that was enumerated in the previous slide was applied in a refinery A uh, in a plant trial in which uh, the field temperature was adjusted at a constant uh, C charge. Uh, so at a constant C charge of about 112, uh, the field temperature was decreased by about two degrees. And uh, it was observed that this increased the yield by about 1.4 gram per liter. Uh, the product minus 325 mesh remained within target, eight to 13%. Uh, it uh, needs to be mentioned though that uh, during this trial, CGM was dosed. Uh, in the same uh, uh, trial, um, the impact of uh, C charge was also investigated. In that trial, the average monthly field temperature was maintained uh, at 83.4 degrees Celsius, and the C charge was increased uh, by 5.4. An increase in yield of about 1.4 gram per liter was observed, and the product mesh minus 325 mesh remained within target of 8 to 13. Uh, in this trial, also, it, it must be mentioned that uh, CGM or crystal growth modifiers were, were used to maintain their product quality. So, in conclusion, uh, Refinery operators desire high liquor productivity for profitability and environmental reasons. However, operating factors that promote high liquor yield are opposed to uh, requirements for uh, product quality. Uh, as a result, refineries tend to operate below the optimum liquor yield levels in order to maintain product quality. A consolidated bauxite alumina and aluminum consultants, CBAC, has developed models and tools that allow refineries to operate at conditions allowing high yields to be achieved without compromising on product quality. A plant trial of these tools at an alumina refinery has demonstrated promising results. The plan trial also demonstrated that significant yield improvements can be achieved without modification of the precipitation circuit and at minimal cost. So that brings me to the end of my talk, and I hope 
uh, this will generate discussions uh, uh, from the from from you all, especially those who are operating alumni refineries. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Alex, for an excellent presentation. Uh, now, I invite any any qu questions, any clarifications on Alex's presentation. You are please go ahead. I have some two two questions which I I will I think I will ask at the end. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question, Alex. Yes. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Who am who, who am I talking to? Is that Iwan? Iwan. Yeah. Iwan. Iwan. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting uh, presentation, Alex. Uh, which is uh, let's say a very hot issue in every refinery. Operators are struggling. Uh, you know, since I entered this industry, this is an issue product quality control, uh, notably the fines generation and uh, occluded soda and uh, the attrition index of uh, the alumina produced. So you you, you mentioned that, uh, uh, of course, you have a number of control parameters in the uh, precipitation circuit to manipulate and to <clears throat> achieve uh, an optimum condition that gives you the high yield and uh, you maintain your product quality. And you're using uh, a model that uh, gives guides you about the uh, quantifying the, the the achievable yield. But my question is: you mentioned you have an, uh, you know that in precipitation, it's a cyclic process because uh, you need a closed loop situation to see over a period of time how the changes that you make, okay, will. Um, Will eventually uh, uh, come to a, 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 a let's say a stable situation again from the one point to the second point. So, uh, and you know that the classification system is very important in this regard as well. So, I haven't seen that in uh, in your modeling and the assessment of the capability of this uh, of the manipulated parameters. You mentioned you have a yield only model that you have used. So my question is, uh, uh, have you also a model that gives you a steady state new situation, including the particle size uh, evolution, including, let's say, the uh, including also the classification system? OK, uh, thank, thank you, Iwan. You can hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, thank you for your question. Yeah, that is a, a very uh, a deep question uh, for alumina refineries uh, regarding the cyclic nature of um, the circuit. Uh, but uh, yes, the model we use, the main purpose of the model is to give us an estimate of potential yield that can be achieved. So the model doesn't really consider uh, the population balance and the cyclic nature of particle size distribution in the circuit. But the approach we use often is uh, the practical uh, part of the trial. And normally we run the trial for minimum a month to make sure that we, uh, we have a feeling for the way the circuit is behaving. So that is uh, using the plant itself to get an understanding of uh, the behavior of the, that particular plant and the cycles in this particle size distribution. And actually testing if it's necessary, if the swings in the particle size are huge and out of control, using some of the tools and some of the tools we've used uh, it will be uh, CGM, for example, to to test 
some CGM and make sure that they are capable of maintaining the product within the specifications. Our experience is that you cannot eliminate the cycles by using a CGM, you can dampen the cycles such that the particle size stays within uh, the limits that they've set in the circuit. So the approach for, I guess the question you're asking about the cycles, our approach is a practical one on the field monitoring and application of the tools to ensure that you know uh, this is controlled within the limits uh, desired by the by the operators it's not based on a model okay okay thank you alex any other especially from the anxious social One more, Shell, question, Amit. Amit. One more question, if this is allowed. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Ivan. Yeah. Alex, what is your uh, opinion on uh, the uh, maximum uh, achievable yield in uh, alumina refineries, uh, new, new generation refineries? And uh, uh, also important in this, you mentioned the seed charge is also one of the uh, key parameters to get uh, higher yield. What is uh, the the maximum uh, gram per liter solids that we can uh, sustain in uh, the precipitators that we know with today's technology? Mm. Well, that is another uh, deep question. Very good question, uh, but it's very difficult to generalize for for alumina refineries i mean i guess there will be what we may call a theoretical yield that is possible and some of the papers i've seen is saying that yields in excess of 95 uh, plus gram per liter are achievable but obviously what can be achieved in each alumina refinery is peculiar to that alumina refinery because there are several factors that play into the yield that can be achieved in a specific alumina refinery. So there is a theoretical that uh, I've seen papers that are saying uh, yields in excess of 95 plus are possible. And then there are the practical that can be achieved in each alumina refinery. And that depends on that particular circuit uh several factors play into that uh not the least is the liquor composition itself but also the design of that particular uh, uh circuit so in a refinery i know in um, in western australia uh, where they had old precipitators and they, they build new ones that you could tell even though the liquor in these circuits were the same uh, there were very significant differences in the yield that is obtained in the old circuit versus the new circuit. And the major difference was that the new circuit was almost like ideal CSTRs, whilst the old circuit were designed as a kind of classifiers. You know, so yeah, the design of the, uh, of the precepts as well as the liquor and uh, uh, all play a, a part in what uh, can be achieved, even with the same, with uh, within the same alumina refinery. I don't know whether that is, uh, uh, gives you uh, uh, answer your question. Yeah, more or less, uh, Alex. And the other question was the uh, the uh, maximum uh, perceivable uh, suspended solid density in uh, the precipitators. Uh, I've seen some very high um, precipitates with very high solid loading uh, and uh, some that operate on quite low solid loading. Um, to be honest, I would leave this to uh, operators to tell what maximum yields they, they've experienced before, but uh, I've been into different alumina refineries and I've seen a range of particle size 
uh, uh, particle uh, loadings in the tanks. And it depends on the, the power in your uh, agitator, the design of the draft tube, as to how uh, your, your ability to recirculate uh, the, the solids in the tank. So yeah, several factors will play into this. And yeah, I don't know whether I can give a, a one number that is a maximum, but I think it will depend on the precipitate design. Maybe you have some insights that I don't know. And if you are happy to share, I'm happy to listen. Oh yes, of course I have some uh, some idea about that. But uh, I was uh, wondering if uh, you had uh, some specific uh, uh, data on that based on uh, to assess the the um, the, cap the capability of each of these uh, parameters in achieving uh, the yield. Okay. So one final question that I have, Mr. More, more a remark. Uh, in your um, in your the starting of your presentation, you 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 listed the benefits of uh, a high yield. I think one of the important benefits that uh, I think you you missed in your uh, list is the uh, the footprint of the uh, of the if you design a new refinery and you have uh, high yield, you know you can uh, reduce capital expenditure in mainly in digestion. You know you may have a smaller a smaller digester unit required for an same nameplate capacity uh, refinery and yeah. uh, your whole uh, piping system pumping system so uh, that is a very important benefit of uh, if you have a new design a new refinery so mm. oh yes yes yep yeah i agree with you yeah uh, i mean i guess uh, a lot of this uh, the modeling that i'm doing is mainly for existing refineries so I didn't place a lot of emphasis on design of new refineries. Uh, we apply this mainly in existing refineries. So definitely, I mean, I agree with you 100% that that is a big uh, factor. Georgie? Okay, thank you, Alex. Thank, thank you, Alex, for your presentation. It, it was it was really interesting. Uh, as i understand uh here you 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 demonstrated the uh, options uh for the for the low hanging fruits but uh, afterwards there, there 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 are next stages uh which require uh, more intellectual and and other kind of effort so, so I would like to hear a little bit about the next stages. Right now, as I understand, uh, this is this is a kind of uh, uh, suggestions by 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 models as far as the uh, precipitation yield is concerned, and combined with with, with trial and error method. Uh, on the plant, when uh, do we reach uh, the constraints of the of the specific specification? That 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 was my first remark or comment. Uh, a, a question: Do you have an idea what could be uh, the the highest A to C ratio? Uh, for the for the precipitation can, can it be for example 0.8 can it be higher that's that's it thank you okay thanks georgie for your question um the highest adc i guess uh, for the precipitation is going to be determined by the highest atc you can achieve a, 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 that is economically viable in your digestion system. So uh, what normally happens in digestion is you can keep increasing your A to C and then you reach a break point, at which point, you know, um, your loss starts becoming quite uh, astronomical. So 
the question then is, is it economic for you to chase the next A to C in digestion? And at what cost can you achieve that? Because at the end of the day, whatever you can put into digestion, you have to put through, like whatever you have to put in principle, you have to put through digestion. So it's what digestion can tolerate. So I think what many uh, alumni refineries do is that they do a digestion breakpoint to determine the maximum they can go. And then that sets their upper limit. Um, so that that will be, I think, the approach I would I would use, uh, determine my digestion breakpoint to determine what my maximum A to C will be. So so I, I asked uh, because in in my uh, uh, tests. Uh, uh, for for my in my obsession the improved low temperature digestion uh, we 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 could obtain uh, well a to c ratio at the digestion effluent for example uh, 0 0.8283 yep so uh, with, 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 without mm, any kind of drawbacks so, yeah. so this is why I, I think that uh, there are uh, fruits. I'm not uh, uh, defining it's low hanging or not low hanging fruit, uh, but at, at the digestion and somehow uh, the the precipitation circuits uh, should uh, uh, be prepared uh, to receive uh, this kind of. Uh, 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 liquor to precipitation. Okay, all right. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. Yeah, that's, it. that's yes. it. Yes. So yeah, definitely. If your uh, analysis of your precip, let's say there is massive capacity to increase supersaturation through um, ADC, <clears throat> then obviously the red side becomes the the bottleneck. Okay, so if you have a lot of capacity to put more through precip, but there are limitations in your digestion area, then, well, that is your bottleneck then. And then I guess that's when you need to look into whether there are ways you can improve uh, higher targets in digestion. Yes. But in my mind, though, I guess when I, I was looking more at the precip side, so when I said the next steps, uh, that would have been, well, if you don't have capacity to cool, for example, the liquor going to precipitation, and you know that lowering temperature further can give you more yield, then the next steps I'm thinking about is more changes in digestion, uh, sorry, in precip area. For example, in terms of cooling, uh, ability to cool the liquor further, okay? But I think you raise a very important question. Even if you can cool the liquor further and you are able to precipitate more, you need to add more bauxite, you know, to make, to make the production. And if your digestion can't handle it, then that is the bottleneck. So yes, you need to look at both sides of the, of the uh, refinery. Good point there. Uh, Alex, uh, extending George's uh, this latest question uh, is more fundamental uh, that, that say like increasing the A by C to 0.8, whether will it produce Na2O and minus 325 within acceptable range? Because currently, well, currently we say the limit is say 0 0.7374, 75. To to yeah. yeah, whether by increasing it to 0.8 or 0.83, like you, what he was mentioning, which the red side can give, but whether we'll be able to use that liquor, ABC, high ABC liquor in the precip and also meet the quality considerations. That was the, yeah. the, the mood point of the question. Yes. So, yeah, that is obviously uh, dependent on what capacity you have to push uh, this supersaturation. So like I say, um, 
what, what normally you would try and do is test your tools to say that, look, I can get up to here. Yeah. So will my tools be able to handle that kind of change? So if what it is pushing beyond the boundaries is a uh, particle size, okay, that uh, your fines are already at its limit, then what you test first is how do I get the fines to come into my uh, control limits? And you would test this and make sure that your tool is working. Then you make the change in digestion to raise the A to C, and hopefully your tool is able to, to handle it. So normally we would do a trial of all of these ideas and, and ensure that we would be able to uh, maintain the particle size, we will be able to maintain the soda in product yeah. in our trial before we we implement everything. Right. Yeah. I, I have two questions. One is related to this, which I will ask the, the, the second question. The first question is, see, you presented some data with respect to blank and with CGM, the lab test. Okay. Uh, the, the yield was in the range of 40 to 40, 45, 50. And uh, the uh, minus 325 was 15 to 35. You, you, you know, these are not the in the normal expected range. No. Right? Both the yield and the, this one. So because when we design uh, lab experiments to test CGMs, yep. the, the, we ensure that in the blank, we get reasonably expected yield with, say, around 15% minus 325. And then use the CGM to test whether it's okay. It is improving the yield as also improving the size. So, do you have any data in in meeting this in the in the range instead of forty percent or forty GPL uh, yield? Whether do you have any data at say at sixty five GPL yield and with the blank and then with CGM, what happens? Yeah, so the, it all depends on how long you do these simulations in the lab for. So how long do you allow the precipitation to to happen? So it uh, it in this test they focus a lot of the precipitation in the growth section. Okay, so often right. the liquor composition tested are liquors that are going to growth, and, and therefore. Uh, some of the yield that could have been obtained is not tested, like what is achieved in, in, uh, uh, in a grown section will not be tested in this test because the test is focused on the impact of, uh, I guess, um, a, a large particle uh, population oh, yeah. and all that. Yeah. So that is where you see that the yields are relatively small. Uh, it's because it's cut short for a specific area of the precepts. Okay, sure. So my the next question is with respect to your the trial and error, what we do in the plant, you make a change, then um, see the effect. And so generally, what is the inertia? That means the time taken for a change to have an effect on the product uh, with respect to soda and uh, this one. It's in weeks or in, uh, Fortnights are in months. And so the test uh, we did, uh, if you look at the data, you see that they were each test was done for a month. month. So we started the trial in April, and in April, the whole month, we would test one condition, say a uh, temperature change, whilst uh, dosing CGM sometimes, taking CGM off to see the impact of no CGM on the particle size, putting it back on. So we will do that for about a month and then we'll average the results, compare it to another month uh, where maybe we also uh, maintain temperature, but we change uh, particle size and we will do cycles to see what CGM is doing in terms of controlling particle size. So yeah, it's over. I so, think in this one that I showed, we did it over a period of three months. Okay, so co quite an elaborate uh, process. Yes. 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 Okay. Sure. Richa Sharma, please ask your your question. Sure. 
she is on mute teacher please unmute yourself kaushal gupta you may ask your question hi alex and shankar sir uh hey. so my question is uh, uh because we are from hindalgo belagavi where we are uh, producing hydrogen hydrate for the specialty grade of alumina okay so where we are uh, there uh, as a customer we can say uh, they are asking for soda as well as three fraction of this hydrate that's uh, plus 325 200 as well as plus 100 also okay so as of my, my knowledge our four refinery uh, we are the only person who are controlling all these fractions so are there any refinery who are controlling this fraction if yes then how sir because this is a little bit difficult well one fraction is coming under control and another is out so, so this is a just question sir so maintaining lower soda with this all this fraction all together so we are more stringent toward the quality you can say alex um, if i can expand this question um, uh, belgam is supposed to produce uh, finer at the coarser end and coarser at the finer end simultaneously that means low minus 325 as also uh, low plus 100 it should not become too coarse or too fine and the, along with the soda the, also because this um, hydrate is produced mainly for uh, um, chemical applications okay yeah so so the challenge is they have to have what the right mix of minus 325 and what minus plus, 100 plus 100 yeah okay plus 100 we were talking a uh, mesh and 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 kaushal was mentioning one more size in between also yeah, plus 200 also sir. plus 200 also <laughs> so uh, a mixture of these size fractions yes yes uh, and this each of them is specified like yes. what percentage of each you need yes yes okay all right so the question is how do you achieve that is that a question yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's that's an interesting uh requirement <laughs> okay um i'm not sure exactly uh what to say to that uh without knowing the full uh yeah, right. story and also what you are achieving now so um it depends which fraction you are not meeting is uh, is it like we are not meeting all three or is one that is difficult to achieve because um i guess particle size distribution uh if you want to reduce a particular fraction or increase a particular fraction there are different um approaches you will use so you need to study what is happening in your circuit first to be able to target which size you need to grow into which size so yeah um i don't know whether i can give a specific answer to your question without knowing the full a history of how your particle size behave uh, but i think if you there is a particular fraction that you want to grow more uh you could target that uh, and it depends which area of the uh, process you target it you know so for example if you want to really get uh, uh the fines consumed or the say 100 uh this uh, the, the final fraction reduced then maybe what you are trying to do is reduce your secondary nucleation as well as consume most of the fines in a globe okay so yeah you need to know a bit of the distribution to be able to target the, the one that you want uh i mean if that's something they they would like us to look more into i'm very happy to look into that for them And, and maybe come with a with a suggestion but without knowing the full story it's a bit hard to tell what they can do yeah uh, okay. hello uh, hello alex yes 
So uh, I'm from Renukut Alumina Refinery. So from last 1.5 years, we are working on improving our yield. So uh, and uh, also have obtained our optimum yield uh, in the existing circuit. So with the same philosophy, as you mentioned, uh, by improving the saturation and the seed charge and the uh, holding time. But uh, um, after a, a period of six months, we have observed that uh, there is an increase in oxalate concentration in the liquor uh, because uh, the impurities also uh, reach uh, to its saturation. Uh, to its uh, some equilibrium concentration over a period of time by improving uh, by increasing the saturation of alumina. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I had uh, observed an impact on soda and uh, fines, but we are controlling through uh, optimizing the operating parameters. But uh, I am very keen to know the impact of oxalate concentration and uh, also how to control it because it is uh, impacting our um, fines actually uh, we we are uh, getting more coarser particles uh, with increased oxalate concentration in the liquor side the liquor concentrate the oxalate concentration is increased from 3 gpl to 4 gpl now it is so and uh, we have also done our critical oxalate concentration analysis and it is coming around 4 gpl uh, coc mm. so uh what what circuit do you run you run a uh, precip with uh oxalate free precip or is co-precipitation uh, it is co precipitation at Rainwood. It's co precipitation. Okay. And what you're saying is what you've observed is that your oxalate concentration is increasing hmm. and uh, also your product is getting coarser. Is that what you're saying? Yes, it, uh, it's time to time becomes coarse, coarser in nature. I don't know. It is the impact of classification. It may be the impact of classification circuit. We need yeah. to improve that or else or anything other uh, reason it may be. So I want to know. Okay. All right. I mean, Renekut is a, a refinery that I've been to uh, several times and I've done some work there before. Um, yeah, this is new to me. I, I didn't think at that time oxalate was an issue at all, but it looks like has the bauxite being processed changed or what has changed in the system? How long have you been there? Okay, actually we have did um, special analysis for our bauxite uh, because we uh, receive bauxite from different sources and has done oxalate analysis, uh, total carbon analysis for each bauxite source, but there is no such deviation in that. Okay, so you don't think there's a, a, any more organics coming in with the bauxite? Uh, uh, actually, from the samples we have observed, uh, there is no such deviation, but I don't know whether uh, consignment may have come with high oxalate. Yeah, okay. Because the other factor is not, it's not always the uh, absolute, uh, uh, absolute organic carbon in the, in the, uh, in the bauxite, but also the nature of the, of the organics. So um, yeah, uh, some organics are, more easily degradable, I guess, than others. So uh, there are there are a few factors about organics that can also, uh, I guess, change what kind of uh, breakdown products you get. So I, I know alumina, some alumina refineries that used to make, monitor what they call um, humates, for example. Uh, because they they observe that humates the nature of humates and the amount of humates does affect uh, the organics in the liquor and and the breakdown products. So it's is a complex area. 
uh, when you, you talk about organics and the, uh, the degradation products of organics. Uh, but I think um, one thing that can be done is, uh, is to see whether you can improve the oxalate remover. Uh, oxalate tends to be self-regulatory. Uh, As you form more, more of it will precipitate and it always come to a certain steady state level. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, unusual that it should go beyond the, the normal solubility of oxalate unless you get other organics that are stabilizing the oxalate in the solution. So that, that, that you would need to study to really understand why the oxalate level is going up. I mean, if that is something the refinery is interested, that is something we can, uh, we can help study uh, to see if we can understand uh, what is causing the oxalate level to, to go up. Uh, with regard, in terms of the coarsening of the circuit, uh, you may be right that this could be due to uh, classification issues. Uh, I mean, if you have coarser product, uh, coarser circuit, you should be able to remove the, the coarse material through classification and therefore control it that way. That should go out with your product instead of accumulating the system. So that, that might be uh, an area you need to look into, your, whether your classification system is working as it should. I don't know, maybe other people have experience in this forum that they may be able to share, but this will be my, my first thoughts about it without really looking deeply into the, uh, into the matter. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Uh, there is another question from Pooja. Pooja, go ahead. Uh, good evening, sir. This is Pooja. Uh, I uh, just had a doubt, like uh, in feed hydrate quality in the precipitation section, we have another uh, parameter to be controlled, which is D50. Uh, so I just want to know if there is uh, contributing any other process fact, uh, parameter that contributes to the control of uh, D50. Okay, so your this is D50 in your product? Yeah. And so uh, explain a bit more to me. When you say, uh, what what is the actual issue with the D50? Has it increased, decreased? Uh, so the thing is, the uh, target that we have uh, for the feed hydrate 50s, uh, it should be minimum 85 and it has to be maintained more than 85. But the thing is, the circuit uh, isn't turning that close that we can achieve the target of above 850. Even if it, uh, the circuit turns closer and we achieve D50 above 85, it's not consistent. I mean, there are a lot of fluctuation that happens. Even if it turns coarser, there will be a reflection in 45 micron, 3.5 micron on the other fractions. But for D50, it's a bit uh, sensitive uh, to be sustained. Okay. So if I understood, then it, what you're saying is you have a target for D50, but it's difficult yeah. to maintain that target. Yeah. Yeah. And it's fluctuating sometimes higher and sometimes lower or on only one side yeah uh, tell it's me it's not consistent it's basically, not consistent so, alex basically this is from belgam and yes. the, the, the previous question was there controlling uh, three fractions so and uh, she she has added another one which is the average particle the size. Yeah. basically it's okay. related to the particle size distribution control yeah so problem okay. is what, sir, uh, what is happening, sir, frankly, it's a one particular grade where we need to maintain the D50, okay? So D50 for one particular grade, we need to maintain higher side, okay? Whenever we are going D50 higher side, then what will happen? Our plus 200 is also going higher side, but they need uh, plus 200 is lower side. So that balance is, uh, that is centering. Okay, suppose we are maintaining one particular grade, then the grade is out, simply. Okay. Yeah, well, I think your requirements they are quite complex. Yeah, so my so basic question is suppose one particular circuit is catering to the many of the these products. So uh, other specialty grade of hydrate wherever it is being produced. So they have different different circuit for different different grades, otherwise 
they are catering all the requirements from the one single circuit. Simple. That can be, I think, summarization of the question. And this is, is this for smelter grade alumina or this is no, a specialty no, grade alumina? Specialty grade alumina. Grade alumina and hydrate, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. Alex, Alex Belgam has uh, more than 100 customers, more than 500 customers. Yeah. And everybody has their specifications. 100 different grades of uh, hydrate and alumina <laughs> with one precipitation circuit. Oh, okay. <laughs> that is. <laughs> You've you've got your work cut out for you then. <laughs> trying to do trying to do all this in one circuit. Achieve yes, all this yes. in one circuit. Right. Uh, I see. Interesting. Well, I mean, if we uh, you want us to uh, be involved and look into these matters, we are more than happy to. But I think it's not something I think I can come with a solution from the questions that are coming out without really looking at some data. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I believe that you can achieve uh, a certain distribution of particle by targeting some opera uh, operating parameters uh, uh, to try and control them. I mean, what you are telling me here look very complicated. It's like you are trying to control different particle size fractions in the same circuit. And that is, yeah. I mean, I know people who are just trying to achieve minus 45 within a certain range and they struggle because of the cycles in, the, in precipes. So to try and control several different particle uh, fractions in the same circuit is uh, a really tough thing to do. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I, I believe um, you would achieve it sometimes, but in a different cycle, you would be struggling to, uh, to, uh, to maintain it all the time. Right. So uh, to, to sit here and say that there is a way you can, you can set your precip circuit and achieve all these particle size specifications all the time, I think I would just sound like a joker to you, you know, <laughs> if I say that. But you, if you look at the whole history of how your system behaves and the conditions you run, you may be able to manipulate it so that most of the time, maybe you would be able to achieve it. But yeah, I, I, it's very hard to say that you achieve it. All these particle size uh, uh, specifications all the time in the, same, in the same circuit because alumina refinery circuits go through cycles. Yes. That, is, that is a fact of life. So I would say, yeah, I'm happy to look at some data and to see whether there is something we can do to try and control uh, but without looking at it in detail, it's hard to tell what to do. Yeah. Thanks, Alex, uh, for the lovely presentation and the uh, excellent uh, Q&A. Uh, I think we are just uh, maybe over short the time. So thanks a lot. We'll keep in touch. And uh, if any of you have any questions, you can pass it on to Alex. Certainly. I'll be happy to. Sure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Right. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks uh, IBAS team, uh, Priyanka. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.